when I started coming into dialogue with The Taming of the Shrew, I made two realizations. One was that only men had soliloquies. Mm -hmm. Petruchio and belatedly I discovered Hortensia and Tranio are the other two who are the only ones on stage speaking. And I also realized that um, all of the monologues that the women got were in public simultaneously. And as you know, my chief interest in this was really thinking through this entire world from the point of view of the women. So my initial proposal um, to you was, well, what if we put songs in as the women's soliloquy space that I could explore an inner life that I could create the subtextual story of what a woman might be feeling, but not saying, especially in front of other men or in front of each other, which is really how I understand why Bianca Kate and the widow are at odds at the end, um, because we're so many years before the, um, the event of sisterhood being important. Um, and so that was what I determined would be the most interesting way to approach Shrew, that I could create a story world that really fleshes out what these stories we weren't hearing about were. And of course, the moment I made that decision, it spread outwards because I realized I wasn't doing a play just about women, but about the other. And um, there were other characters in the play that became incredibly important to me, especially Tranio and Biondello, um, as I fleshed out this play in terms of their perspective of being othered from what was normal. Um, and uh, in our ability now to use what I'm using as an all-male cast as a reflection of what can also be a representation of universal rather than an, a normal heteronormative world that we would watch on stage, it felt as important to give them that voice too. So that's basically what I ended up doing with this play is I identified first all the transitions I would have to do and I made them all song moments. Um, because at that point the set would have to be moving anyway. And then I created this space of X number of song moments where I realized I could pull in whatever character had just finished or completed a scene or were about to begin a scene and give them a soliloquy of inner thought, which would frame the way I would be able to watch the scene after. And I was so very lucky because at the time when I was beginning this exploration, I had, be, I had become friends with Duncan Sheik um, working on his musical Whisper House, and he had just introduced me um, to his musical Nero. And I'd fallen in love with his music because of two reasons. Duncan's music reminded me of my adolescence because he evoked early Oasis, early Blur, that was me at 12 or 13. The sound of the high tenor male voice with um, an emotional underpinning to their pop rock in the alternative world was so new back then. And I remember it was such nostalgia and like release of feeling for me because it was a, such a new sound and so authentic. And that's very much the sound of Duncan as, a, as an originating artist. But what I also love about Duncan is that he is singularly incapable of being ironic or cynical. Um, he writes from the point of view of sincerity, which makes him, I think, almost utterly unique in the world of, you know, um, uh, uh, music stars um, and music acts of this day. And of course, once I started to get to know Duncan's work within his own musical theatre, he writes music from the point of view of in a soliloquy. It is never about how can I progress the plot along, but there is always story. And it is so interesting because I realised, um, you know, into our partnership that um, that Duncan writes music um, to be sung in the way that an opera composer might have written music to be sung in an aria. It is an examination of what I am feeling at this moment, and that's what the aria tunnels into. And then we'll get back to the plot.